In Bethlehem College and Seminary Chapel this semester, we are preaching on the five solas of the Protestant Reformation, and we're devoting two sermons to sola fide. You remember that a few months ago, you heard a sermon already by our chancellor, John Piper, on sola fide, and now you're about to hear a second one. And in that first sermon, Dr. Piper argued that the five prepositional phrases we call the five solas don't make sense unless they're modifying a phrase. Otherwise, they're just hanging in the air. Do any of you remember the phrase he wanted to attach them to? Justification before God is, and then he plugged in the five solas. Or another way we could say that, and I'm going to use my computer as a whiteboard as I'm talking here, could say God justifies us and then plug in those five solas. So sola gratia, God justifies us by grace alone. God justifies us sola Christo, or on the basis of Christ alone. Or God justifies us sola fide, that's our focus today. That would be through the means of faith alone. God justifies us soli Deo Gloria, to the ultimate glory of God alone. And finally, God justifies us sola scriptura, as taught with the final authority, the final, you say final and decisive authority. I think that's how John Piper put it. Decisive authority of scripture alone. Those are the five solas. Now, instead of choosing just one passage of Scripture to go to to explain this concept of sola fide in this sermon, I'm going to attempt to synthesize what Paul teaches about justification in his letter to the Romans, which is crazy, uh, but I'm, I'm going to try this. So justification according to Romans. And if we dare speak of portions of Scripture as more important than others, then I would argue that Romans is the most single important piece of literature in the history of the world. And at the heart of Romans is justification. Now, I don't have time to exegete all the passages in Romans about justification, so what I'm going to do is try to synthesize it all. I'm going to show how Romans contributes to a systematic theology of justification. And I'm going to do that under eight headings, And under those eight headings, I have 19 statements. And I will go quickly, and we will get out on time, so you don't have to worry about that, but you got to hang with me. So let me just show you the the eight headings so you can see where we're going. So we've got eight headings. Here they are. First, you got to start by defining your terms. So the meaning of justification, what is it? And second, why do you need this? Why is it necessary? So the need for justification. And then third, the basis of justification. Fourth is how you get it, the the means of justification. Fifth is who can experience this, the accessibility of justification. Sixth is beautiful, the results of justification, what flows from this once you experience it. And then uh, sixth or seventh is the goal of justification. And finally, no, it's the future of justification. And then finally, the goal. So we'll spend the least amount of time on that one, so you'll see. So let's start by defining terms with the meaning of justification. So here's statement one of 19. Justification is judicial, not experiential. I might take the most time on this first statement, so so hang with me here. And we're going to be looking at a lot of passages. We'll start with Romans 1, so if you want to turn there, go ahead. Um, I'd encourage you to, to look at the passages as I refer to them, but I'll be referring to them pretty quickly. So Romans 1, 16 and 17 is where we'll start. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Most commentators agree that Romans 1, 16 and 17 is connected to the letter's theological message. So here's, here's what Paul says. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is in the gospel, The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Catch that? In it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So one way you could 
could translate that with an, an active voice is the gospel reveals what? What does it reveal? It's right there. Look at verse 17. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Right. That's not debated. What's debated is how do you precisely identify that phrase? The righteousness of God. What does that mean? So there are three basic options, and exegetes combine them in every way conceivable. So what I'd like to do is just show you the three main views on interpreting the righteousness of God in Romans 1.17, and then I'll, I'll show you my view. And it's not just 117 where this phrase occurs. It occurs several times in chapter 3 and twice in Romans 10 as well and elsewhere in Paul's letters. So here are the, the three basic uh, views on what is the righteousness of God. So one view is that the righteousness of God is what God is. So it's God's attribute of being righteous or just. So what would, what would the opposite of that be? It's the next verse, verse 18. The ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So God is righteous, humans are unrighteous. So the phrase righteousness of God is what God fundamentally is. Option two, the righteousness of God is what God gives. So it's God's gift of a righteous status to sinful people. So According to this view, the metaphor is from the law court. So righteousness is judicial. It's not about people living in a more righteous way. So righteousness is not transforming your character. So this gift is, is about God's legally declaring someone is not guilty before him. It's not about morally making that person righteous by gradually infusing righteousness into him. And a third view, third option here, what God does. So it's God's activity of saving sinful people. God writes what is wrong. And not all, but some people who hold this view define God's righteousness as his covenant faithfulness. And they define justification as what enables us to know who is part of the people of God particularly by declaring that God has included Gentiles in his covenant community, okay? So those are the three main views, and I think it's too narrow to insist that the righteousness of God refers to only one of those three and not the other two. So I agree with John Stott and how he, he reflects on, on these three views. He says, all three are true and have been held by different scholars, sometimes in relation to each other. For myself, I've never been able to see why we have to choose and why all three should not be combined. So here's, here's my view. I think that most fundamentally is the first one. The righteousness of God most fundamentally is God's attribute of being righteous. Of being righteous. In the context of Romans, when Paul uses that phrase, the righteousness of God, most often it's, it's emphasizing, option two, God's gift of a righteous status. And that's all entailing that God is actively saving sinful people. I don't hold to that covenant faithfulness definition for, for view three. So God's gift of a righteous status, that number two there, is most prominent throughout Romans. I think most fundamentally what righteousness of God refers to is his his righteous character. And then when people experience that aspect of God's righteous character, they'll, they'll experience one of two things. Either God saves them by righteously giving them a righteous status, or God condemns them. That's what happens when people experience the righteousness of God. And while God will faithfully fulfill his promises because he's righteous, the essence of the righteousness of God is not his covenant faithfulness. So I, I joyfully affirm what we've been celebrating all semester, the, the traditional Protestant view of justification. Now, you remember this, before Luther embraced justification by faith alone, he was in terror and despair over that phrase right here, the righteousness of God. Do you remember how he took that phrase initially? 
He thought it referred to the exacting justice of God, that God was going to damn him. He hated God for that. This, the, righteousness of, the righteousness of God was not comforting to him at all. It, it made him in, uh, be in terror. So his exegetical breakthrough came when he studied Psalms, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, especially this passage, Romans 1, 16 and 17. And the breakthrough was when he realized that not only is God righteous, but he gives righteousness. I, I haven't heard anyone put this better than John Stott. I'm gonna short quote here. This is so good. He says, the righteousness of God is God's just justification of the unjust. His righteous way of pronouncing the unrighteous righteous, in which he both demonstrates his righteousness and gives righteousness to us. He's done it through Christ, the righteous one, who died for the unrighteous, and he does it by faith when we put our trust in him and cry to him for mercy. The gospel reveals God's righteous way of righteousing the unrighteous. Isn't that good? God's righteous way of righteousing the unrighteous. So the righteousness of God is not just what God is, it's also what he gives when he saves you. He's both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's Romans 3, 26. God righteously righteouses the unrighteous. So defining our terms, what then is justification? Justification refers to to declare righteous, it's to declare righteous. It's not to make righteous in the sense of transforming your character to be righteous. This is a metaphor from the law court where a judge pronounces either not guilty or guilty. And, and we know this from Romans 8, 33 and 34 where Paul says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. He, he takes justify and condemn and contrasts them. So one is declaring not guilty, one is declaring guilty. And justification is it's not just saying not guilty, it's that you're innocent. It's you're not guilty in the sense that you're innocent, but righteous. That's the contrast to condemnation. It is God who justifies. God justifies the ungodly in that he legally declares ungodly people to be innocent and righteous. Oof, this is good. All right, now, number two. We'll go more, uh, more quickly now. Justification includes forgiveness. Romans 4, 5 through 8 says this. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, and imagine how that phrase would, would land on the ears of, of hearers who realize he's referring to Abraham. He justifies the ungodly. He just called Abraham ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness, just as David speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. When God justifies you as a believing sinner, he forgives your lawless deeds. He covers your sins and no longer counts them against you. Praise God. That's part of what justification includes. It includes forgiveness. Third, justification includes imputation. Justification includes imputation. Justification is a blessing because God imputes Christ's righteousness to us as believing sinners. God doesn't merely cancel our guilt and declare that we're, we're neutrally innocent. God imputes Christ's righteousness to our account and declares that we are positively righteous. That's why the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works experiences a blessing, Romans 4, 6. That's why Romans 5, 19 says, as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. They will have the status of righteous. Number four, justification is vertical, not horizontal. So contrary to what's called the new perspective on Paul, which I will not explain in detail here, justification is fundamentally about how sinful humans relate to the holy, righteous God, not to how they relate 
to other humans. Justification is primarily the, about the doctrine of salvation, not the doctrine of the church. So that's the meaning of justification. Now let's look at the need for justification. Just one statement here. Justification is necessary because all humans, without exception, are sinners under God's condemning wrath. This is the message of the first part of Romans, 118 through 320. You can't stand before God as righteous on your own merits. Our, our culture, as you know, loves to celebrate that humans are basically good people. They're not sinners. And if a human does something that's harmful, it must be because of some complex of sociological factors that negatively affected that person. But you know this from Romans. You're not good. You're bad. Paul quotes the Old Testament in Romans 3 and says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Not even you. I was explaining this to my kids the other day, and uh, it just popped into my head. Oh, there was a, a good... Uh, YouTube video of John Piper from a John Piper sermon. So I looked it up and played it for them. And it's where he's, I think he was in this pulpit. And he said, have you heard this one? John Piper is bad. Remember that one? He says, I don't just do bad things. I am bad. And so are you. (laughs) So my kids run around the house quoting that. (laughs) And they love the last line. And so are you. (laughs) And it's funny. We laugh. And it's fine to laugh at that clip. There's also a jingle that goes with it with a song by some pop culture person singing I'm Bad. Um, I I don't think it's a laughing matter, though, to say that humans are not bad, that they're essentially good. That's, That's bad because it undermines the gospel. Because the gospel is good news. And the good news we proclaim is only as good as the bad news is bad. And if you take away the bad news, we don't have any good news to offer. But in reality, as you know, the bad news is really bad, namely that we deserve God's wrath because we've rebelled against our creator. We need justification because we're all sinners under God's wrath. Now, third category, the basis of justification. I think I have three statements here that all start off the same way. Justification is based on God's imputing Christ's righteousness to believing sinners. So what distinguishes my three statements is the next phrase. So first here is, which is possible because of propitiation. So here, I'd encourage you to look at Romans 3, 21 to 26. Arguably, this is the most important paragraph in the Bible. Romans 3, 21 to 26. Paul writes this, 321. But now, the righteousness of God is revealed, or the righteousness of God has been manifested, apart from the law to which the law and the prophets testify, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, a lot to to talk about here. I'll try to be concise. In the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day, Pagans would offer sacrifices to their God to make the gods, here's the word, propitious or favorable. So their sacrifices, what do you think they were called? Their sacrifices were called propitiations. Now, that parallel breaks down when we apply it to Jesus' propitiation that made God the Father propitious because God the Father himself sends Jesus, God the Son, to make the propitiation. So propitiation is the only biblical term for God's saving us for which God is both the subject and the object. So let me, let me show this to you make it more clear. 
God is the one who propitiates, and that he's the subject doing the propitiation, and God is the one who is propitiated. Let me make it more clear. God, the Son, propitiates, I can't spell, propitiates God, the Father. So God, the Son, is the propitiation. God, the Father, is the propitiated. Jesus' sacrificial death propitiates the Father. That is, Jesus turns God's wrath into favor. It's on that basis that God righteously righteouses the unrighteous. That's why propitiation is so important and so glorious. God presented Jesus as a propitiation to demonstrate that he's righteous. And verses 25 and 26 unpack that. He was righteous for leaving the sins committed before the cross unpunished. That's verse 25. And he is righteous to declare that believing sinners are righteous. That's verse 26. So let's look at those quickly in turn. First, verse 25, God was righteous for leaving the sins committed before the cross unpunished. And you might pause over verse 25, which says, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. What does that mean? I think Paul's point is that Old Testament sacrifices were valid in God's mind based on Christ's future sacrifice. So yesterday, I'm driving down the road, and I look at the dashboard, and it's almost on empty for my, my gas. So I pull over to a gas station. It's freezing. I get out my wallet, take out my credit card, pop it in the machine, fill up the car, drive off. I never even went into the store. I never pulled money out of my wallet. I, never, I still, to this day, haven't paid for the gas. I, I just got the gas by putting a plastic card into a machine. How cool is that? Now, some of you are chuckling because you know that within a month, I will get a statement from my credit card company with a, a bill payable for the amount that that gas cost. But at this point, has anyone paid for the gas? Have I paid for the gas? No, I got it on credit. I will pay for the gas by God's grace uh, in the future, but I haven't yet. I got the gas on credit. You with me? Okay. Now, think of an Old Testament believer who is trusting God and living a life of faith and offering sacrifices as God prescribed. That Old Testament believer would offer sacrifices in faith and would God genuinely forgive that person? Yeah, that person got genuine forgiveness. But who paid for it? The, the animal they slaughtered at the moment didn't pay for it. Jesus paid for it at the cross. He got the bill later. That's why verse 30, uh, 325 is so important. Paul's arguing that Christ died publicly to demonstrate God's righteousness in saving Old Testament saints on credit. Now look at the next, next sentence, verse 26. It's actually not a new sentence, the, the next phrase. Verse 26, God is righteous to declare that believing sinners are righteous. Now, I was, I was recently talking to a close relative of mine who had just informed me that he no longer professes to be a Christian. And one reason he shared with me for not embracing Christianity, and he told me, uh, Andy, I, th I think the doctrine of justification is immoral. Oh, okay. Um, well, I said to him, is this what you had in mind, this kind of illustration? where people will say that, that the gospel is like a judge uh, and he's, he's standing at the bar and there's a criminal before him who, who is guilty and the judge pronounces that criminal guilty. And, you know, case closed. And then the judge takes off his robes, comes down and takes that person's place. He pays the fine, goes to jail, whatever, but takes that person's place. I said to my, my relative, is that the illustration you have in mind? He said, yeah. And I told him, I agree with you. I think that illustration is terribly misleading. Now, what I'm about to say is uh, I'm indebted to my mentor, Don Carson, for this. Uh, the illustration is correct for illustrating substitution, that Jesus 
dies in our place. But where it breaks down is how we perceive the Western judicial system in that illustration. In the Western judicial system, if a judge is in any way connected to the crime, what must that judge do? Must recuse himself, excuse himself from the case. Otherwise, people would say he didn't judge impartially, right? He, 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 he cannot be involved in a case where it's personal. What's happening in our judicial system is when someone commits a crime, it's not a crime against a person, against the judge, it's a crime against the state, it's a crime against the public, the law, the crown. It's, it's not a crime against the judge, but not with God. God is both the judge and the most offended party whenever we sin. And he never recuses himself and he's always just. And the reason he can justly pronounce believing sinners to be innocent is propitiation. It's that Jesus propitiates his righteous wrath. Justice is served. So propitiation demonstrates that God is righteous when he declares that a believing sinner is righteous. That's the, the wording in 326. He's both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Justification is possible because of propitiation. Number seven, justification is based on God's imputing Christ's righteousness to believing sinners, which is possible because God raised Christ from the dead. Listen to Romans 4, 23 through 25. But the words it was counted to him, that is to Abraham, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, and here it is, and raised for our justification. Jesus was raised for our justification, Romans 3.25. God raised Christ from the dead to publicly vindicate Christ and thus take care of or confirm our justification. Justification is possible because God raised Jesus from the dead. Number eight, justification is based on God's imputing Christ's righteousness to believing sinners, which is possible because of union with Christ. And this is related to the previous two statements about propitiation and resurrection. Christ's propitiation and resurrection benefit us believing sinners because we are united to Christ. That's the only way it can benefit us. Romans 3.24 asserts we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 begins, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Justification is possible because of our union with Christ, because we're in Christ Jesus. Next category, the means of justification. And this is where we get closest to our, our topic of sola fide, faith alone. So these, these next few statements are most directly talking about that issue. First, justification is a gracious gift that sinful humans cannot earn. Our culture despises the idea of sin, of, of breaking moral rules from God. And if there is a God, you can earn his approval by living well. You know the name Michael Bloomberg? Bloomberg, he's currently the eighth richest person in the world. Uh, he was mayor of New York City for three terms from 2002 to 2013, and several months after he completed his final term as governor, the New York Times interviewed him. And I want to show you an excerpt from that interview. Here's the article. Uh, but if he senses that he may not have as much time left as he would like, he has little doubt about what would await him at a judgment day. Pointing to his work on gun safety, obesity, and smoking cessation, he said with a grin, I'm telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I am heading straight in. I have earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. 
I have earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. When I first read that, I cried. It is tragically pathetic. Yet how many people do they think like that? They think they can earn God's approval by how they live. Maybe you're thinking that. That's tragic because the means of our justification is not our good works. We are justified, Romans 3, 24 says, we're justified freely, that is, it's as a gift, without payment, justified freely and by his grace. Freely, by his grace. So we sinners cannot merit a right standing before God based on our works. So we can't boast before God, Romans 4, 2. In John Calvin's Institutes, he infers a universal principle from Romans 4, 2. He says this, whoever glories in himself glories against God. Whoever glories in himself glories against God. You cannot earn God's favor by being good. That flawed approach is really the fundamental error of most world religions, which devise elaborate rituals and ceremonies and rules that you must follow to earn God's favor. But because you're a sinner, justification is a gracious gift you can't earn. And hand in hand with, with this statement is the next one. Justification is accessible by faith alone in Christ alone. Romans 3.25 says that God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Received by faith. Romans 5.1 is true for all genuine believers. We have been justified by faith. The means of justification is faith in Christ. It does not include works. And the object of faith does not include yourself or anyone else other than God in Christ. Maybe the most important passage in the Bible on that is Romans 4, 5. I'm going to just write out the wording for you here from Romans 4, 5. Okay, Romans 4, 5 says this. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That's where we get faith alone, in Christ alone. It's not your works. It's solely by believing in him who justifies the ungodly, not the righteous ones. He justifies the ungodly. One more statement here. Justification occur occurs through redemption. We're justified, according to Romans 3.24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the human means of justification is faith. The divine means is redemption. Now th this redemption metaphor is drawn from the world of commerce and slavery. So redemption in both the Greco-Roman and Jewish contexts commonly refer to freedom from slavery after someone paid the price or the ransom. In our case, we are enslaved to sin and Jesus frees us from that slavery by paying the price. It's beautiful. Next category, just one statement here on the accessibility of justification. Justification is accessible to everyone without ethnic distinction. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, Jew or Greek. That's from Romans 10. Romans 3, 22 and 23, uh, Paul argues that the righteousness of God is universally available without ethnic distinction. 
It's available only by trusting Jesus, and it's available for all who trust Jesus, whether Jews or Gentiles. The, the, the words in 322 are through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And I think he says that for all who believe because he's connecting that paragraph, 321 to 26, with the previous section, 118 to 320. And that previous section is saying all are under sin, all are condemned, all need God's righteousness. And Paul's connecting that to say, and all are savable, both Jews and Greeks. Justification is accessible to everyone without ethnic distinction. Next category, the results of justification. And this is amazing, these results that follow. I'm going to have to go quickly. Uh, Here's one. Justification is now inseparably connected to freedom from the law. So God's people are now under the new covenant. We're not under the Mosaic law covenant. Justification now fulfills the law, 321, 331, 84. The Old Testament prophetically testifies to this shift, this salvation is quite salvation historical shift that occurs in the person of Jesus and his death that made the Mosaic law covenant obsolete. Now, God's people uphold the law by this faith. That's what Romans 3.31 says. Here's another result. Justification is inseparably connected to peace with God. Romans 5 begins like this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So whereas the the justification metaphor is judicial, the reconciliation metaphor is relational. Before being justified, we're God's enemy. We're under his righteous wrath. After being justified, we're God's friend. We have peace with God. That's a result of justification. Here's another result. Justification is is inseparably connected to the most deeply rooted and satisfying rejoicing. Romans 5.2 says that we who are justified rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 5.3 through 10, we rejoice in our sufferings. 5.11, more than that, we also rejoice in God himself. We rejoice in God. Justification is good news not primarily because God forgives our sins. And the forgiveness part is wonderful. It's great. It's glorious. But that's not what's most wonderful about justification. Justification is good news primarily because it enables us to enjoy God, which is the most deeply rooted and satisfying kind of rejoicing possible. Here's another result. Justification is inseparably connected to progressive sanctification. John Gerstner argues that for Roman Catholics, faith plus works leads to or results in justification. Whereas for Protestants, it's different. For Protestants, faith leads to or results in justification plus works. See the difference? But even some Protestants, especially advocates of what's called higher life theology, separate justification from progressive sanctification. But Paul argues in Romans 6 that God frees us not only from sin's penalty, but also from sin's tyranny. Sin is no longer our master if God has justified you. So progressive sanctification is distinct, yet inseparable from justification. Here's a table from No Quick Fix. It's a a book where I try to tell the story of higher life theology and explain it and critique it. Notice the two columns here that say justification and progressive sanctification. I want to contrast them. So, Instantly declared righteous, gradually made righteous. Objective, judicial, non-experiential, legal, forensic position. Subjective, experiential, daily experience. External, outside the believer. Internal, inside the believer. Christ's righteousness imputed, received judicially. 
Christ's righteousness imparted, worked out experientially, instantly removes sin's guilt and penalty, gradually removes sin's pollution and power, does not change character, gradually transforms character. All Christians share the same legal standing. Christians are at different stages of growth. And a single, instantaneous, completed act, once for all time, never repeated, a continuing process, gradual, maturing, lifelong. So those are two distinct concepts, but they're inseparable. You can't have one without the other. They go together. Faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. God's grace, through the power of his spirit, ensures that the same faith that justifies also progressively sanctifies. Bearing fruit flows from justification. Here's another result. Justification is inseparably connected to assurance that God will finish what he planned, accomplished, and applied. Listen to Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now watch this. God planned to save his people. He foreknew and predestined them. God accomplished his plan through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. God applied his plan. He effectually called and justified his people. And God will finish what he started. He will glorify them. Romans 8 ends by arguing that since God is for us, nothing, absolutely nothing can be against us. That is a result of justification. I told you that section was good. The results of justification are amazing. Can can you imagine anything better than that? All right, now quickly here, the future of justification. Justification is already definitive, but not yet complete. When God initially justifies you, that justification is definitive and once for all time, but it's private. When God resurrects you in the future, he will publicly vindicate you at the last judgment. Now this is clearer in Galatians than it is in Romans, but some passages in Romans could refer to that final justification, 2.13, 5.18, and 8.30 through 34. That's all I'll say about that. Final category, the goal of justification. And our final statement here, justification ultimately glorifies God. A goal of justification is to enable guilty sinners to stand before the righteous God as righteous. Amen. But that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to glorify God. Justification ultimately glorifies God. That's why chapters one through eight end by praising God for the results of justification, namely that if God is for us, who could be against us? And it's why chapters nine, 10, and 11 end by praising God for his deep riches and wisdom and knowledge in how he chose to save people throughout history. And it's why the letter itself ends by praising God for his righteousness that is now revealed apart from the law covenant and to which the law and the prophets testify. Here's how the letter ends. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ, amen. In other words, from him and through him and to him are all things, especially our justification. To him be glory forever. Amen. So here's how I'd summarize in one sentence what Paul teaches about justification in Romans. The righteous God righteously righteous is the unrighteous. And the human means through which God does that is faith. Faith is 
and nothing else. Faith alone. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for planning to save us. Thank you for accomplishing that plan through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Thank you for applying that plan through the Holy Spirit and enabling us to repent and believe in Jesus. Thank you that you will finish what you started since you're for us, absolutely nothing can be against us. Thank you, Jesus, that in our place condemned you stood. Your blood has washed away our sins. Jesus, thank you for forgiveness. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you for propitiation. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you for reconciliation. 